Hello, welcome to the Monday, July 31st, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. This weekend at DEF CON in Las Vegas, two researchers released details about a flaw in Windows that can be used to shut down a Windows system by flooding it with SMB requests. The attack works uh, somewhat similar to an older attack that attacked web servers. The web server attack was dubbed the slow loris. So in order to show that similarity, this new attack has been named SMB loris. However, the details how the attack works is a little bit different. In slow loris, all you did is you chewed up all the connections that a server could handle. So essentially you would connect to the web server and send a couple of headers and then just stop sending any additional data before the complete set of headers was sent. The end effect was that the system ran out of connections, but the system itself was still responsive, it could still be, for example, re booted remotely via another service like SSH. SMB Loris is a little bit more dangerous in that sense. The SMB Loris attack opens an SMB connection and requests a buffer. The maximum buffer size possible for this request is 128 kilobyte, which isn't really a lot, but still enough once you realize that for each source IP address, you can open 65,535 connections, one for each source port, which will reserve about eight gigabyte. Now, uh, this memory is allocated uh, without allowing it to be paged uh, to swap. So uh, this has to be located in physical RAM and eight gigabyte is quite a bit. Of course, with a multiple source IPs, you would be able to get multiples of eight gigabyte reserved. After 30 seconds, the memory is freed. So you would have to flood the system with the necessary number of connections within 30 seconds seconds. Now, unlike in the HTTP slow loris case, the system, however, becomes completely unresponsive. What happens is that as the system tries to find more memory, the CPU is scanning the memory for any free memory and essentially it gets stuck doing so, no longer having any time to do anything else. And the system has to be rebooted via a power switch. Now, Microsoft does not intend to really fix this problem and it does appear to be a little bit uh, tricky to fix this. In the HTTP case, the timeout was reduced, which of course didn't really fix the problem, but made it a little bit more difficult to exploit the vulnerability. 30 seconds is already sort of short, so don't think they'll be able to reduce that much more. They could probably limit the total number of SMB connections that a system can accept in order to at least keep the system responsive, even though SMB, of course, may at this point no longer be able to accept any connections. Nothing really different you have to do from a defensive point of view. You probably already are blocking all inbound SMB connections. That would be step number one. Having out of band uh, connectivity to your servers, of course, is always a good idea in order to be able to recover them if they're getting hit by an attack like this one. And Guy was writing about some phishing messages that he received via SMS. Uh, nothing really particularly new and different here. Some tricky URLs that the attackers used in order to make their phishing messages more plausible. As a listener to this podcast, you probably have no problem identifying these bad links, but some of the screenshots used here probably make good awareness material in order to tell your friends and relatives about these attacks. And we got also another car hacking story out of DEF CON, this time affecting the Nissan LEAF. Now, in this case, two interesting vulnerabilities were discovered. The first one was actually a domain that these cars connect to that Nissan no longer owns. So the researchers here just registered that domain again and then 
immediately received telemetrics from various cars with location and the like. Also, the baseband chip that was used by this particular car for GPRS connectivity turned out to be vulnerable and it was known to be vulnerable based on its being used in some iPhones back in 2010. So an exploit against this chipset actually allowed the attackers to then send commands to the CAN bus of the car, which of course controls the car. Now, the vulnerability is actually not unique to Nissan or the Nissan Leaf. It's a part of a remote access module that's manufactured by Continental, who delivers them to a number of other car manufacturers as well. And it can be assumed that these other cars are also vulnerable. Well, that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.